Guru Nation. Welcome back to the clinicaltrialsguru.com. I have a very special guest for you guys today and gals, Suha Sala. She's a CRA. And actually, why don't you introduce yourself, Suha? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Suha Sala. I'm a senior CRA, too. I've been a CRA for about four years now. Um, I got my start in the industry after graduation, so 2010, and I started out as a CTA. I actually started out in regulatory, if you want to go back that far, and then I was a CTA for a little while, and then I moved up to being a senior CRA to where I'm at now. And so, okay, so a lot. I have a CRA academy. A lot of students are going to want me to focus in on that and there's going to be a lot of content for you site owners or, or study coordinators so you sites out there we're going to get into some site stuff too but how did you get a job right out of college is that what you said right out of college yeah it was right out of college it was kind of um, in a dip in the economy too um, yeah how'd well, you pull that off political. so I was really persistent I kind of wanted to make sure that I was going to have a job upon graduation so I started early that's what I would recommend to anybody that's wanting to get a head start in the industry to just you know maybe take the beginning of the last semester in college that you're in and really uh, network well so um, I actually got my start by reaching out to recruiters and I was very persistent I would follow up almost weekly to see what kind of jobs that they had and um, you know even though I was kind of really wanting to make sure I had a job I didn't accept everything they gave me I wanted to make sure that once I was put in it was going to be towards the um, you know the career path that I wanted so once I got an in in a big CRO um, even though it was regulatory and I, wa I knew I wanted to do clean ops eventually mm. I said yes because it was a good um, opportunity so how many and you said you started in regulatory how many interviews did you have to do total mm. or how many applications did you have to do total to just get one job so I the nice thing about working with a recruiter is you just send them your resume and they do the work for you. That's kind of what I would really actually recommend. It takes a lot of the guesswork out of things. So if you uh, work with a good recruiter, you know, I wouldn't recommend double dipping because sometimes you'll get like two interviews at once and you're like, ah, I don't know which one, you know, which job I'd go to. So I'd recommend with kind of sticking with one recruiter or one company and kind of throwing your application out there. And so once you get a good response from, or, you know, you kind of feel like it's getting serious from one of those avenues, then you kind of work with them closely to set up, um, like, you know, a, a good um, interview time or, you know, you, you go ahead and kind of work with them to figure out this is the interview that I want to go with or this is the job that mm -hmm. I want to go with. And what made sense. you, what made you in college uh, mm -hmm. even know that you wanted to do research? Like how did you even get introduced to this field? Yeah. So um, I went to pharmacy school, I have a bachelor's in pharmaceutical sciences. So um, I didn't want to go do the um, actual pharmacy route, like the retail pharmacy route. Cause I worked at a pharmacy for four years and I, you know, I didn't feel like that's how I wanted to spend the rest of my career. Yeah, I'm so. pre farm. I'm pre farm <laughs> also. I was a pre farm major, and uh, yeah. and they kept asking me because I would go to the meetings uh, at at uh, University of Arizona for the pharmacy school, and they mm -hmm. would ask all the students, you know, all the undergrads, why do you want to be a pharmacist? And my mm -hmm. answer was because I want to own my own pharmacy. You know, and then yeah. I real I slowly started realizing that I'm more of a entrepreneur and less of a scientist and so that's that's yeah. the route I chose so similar yeah we're both pre-farm exactly yeah I think a lot of people that I've talked to have started out in one field and they got this opportunity like I have co-workers that are PhDs in biology and uh, co-workers that are like English majors so you know it, you might start out thinking that you want to go somewhere but you eventually end up somewhere else or like you you know you might become a site owner or site manager or something similar to in this field mm -hmm. now how did you go from regulatory and mm -hmm. how long did it take you and uh, to get to CRA, like, did you get invited or asked to be a CRA, or did you have to actively pursue even when you were 
already working in the company? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a really good question. So two parts. The first thing is when you work with a recruiter, sometimes you get contract opportunities. And that's actually how I started. So like I mentioned, that dip in the economy at the time or the hiring, uh, it's kind of like a hiring freeze, basically. So they were very cautious about hiring full-time employees, but they were hiring contractors because big companies sometimes don't want to make that commitment where they bring on full-time employees and it doesn't work out. So I started out as a contractor. Um, so after my contract, um, I went to, I think, another um, department, and then I became um, a CTA still as a contractor. CTA, so, clinical trial assistant or administrator? What is that? Clinical trials assistant. Okay. So that's the biggest... Um, start for a lot of CRAs is becoming a CTA first, a clinical trials assistant. Is that same thing as an in-house CRA or is that like another step above the CTA? That's, yeah, that's another good question. So a lot of uh, companies have them where they're the same role, but some companies, the bigger the company, the more specialized they are. So um, they, uh, it was a different role than an in-house CRA or what we call the ICRA. So that's another Start, but it's also kind of harder to get into being an ICRA right away. It's easier to be a CTA first. Um, so I would focus on getting that instead of an ICRA position because even for um, ICRAs, they're requiring CRA experience now. So basically, if I get this, correct me if I'm wrong, you got a, <laughs> the economy was bad, the, so you were getting contract positions. And each time your contract would expire, they would mm-hmm. tell you, hey, you can reapply. And then you could reapply on for a different job title? Exactly, yeah. So you could, um, whatever other contract opportunities they would had, uh-huh. they would just shift, shift you to that one. And it they like, like you because they don't care what you do. If they like the person, they, they want you to stay with them rather than go somewhere else. Exactly. So it's important to keep kind of a, still a good relationship with the company and the recruiter throughout the whole time, which I made sure because... Um, other, my other coworkers w- did not have the same opportunity that I did. I, you know, I really worked hard to make sure that they would keep calling me back whenever new opportunities started because I knew I eventually wanted to be a full-time employee. That was my goal because I knew from there I could, you know, do the CRA part. So I made sure that I was very flexible, that I did the work that I was asked to do and being a good employee (laughs) and did you get were you actually an employee of the recruiting company and did you get paid by them Mm -hmm. yep so you get your paycheck through the um uh, recruiting company and they take off the top for sure right yep yep they sure do do you know the like the percentage approximately um i don't actually but i do know that you're gonna get um initially you would get paid really low because of that yeah. you know because they take a lot and you would think you know they'd negotiate a higher salary for you because they would take more of the top off for them but it doesn't work like that yeah. they it's kind of like they try to do what's in the best interest of the company that they're hiring so the company that's hiring is wanting to pay the lowest they can right so they try to low sell you instead of upsell you if that makes sense but that's a good way to get started right yeah uh, i mean it's like paying for it but you're getting your start and now you're a full-time employee right With... exactly yeah so after um being a contractor uh usually so contracting is about like six months periods at a time you know usually the extend it um so after six months of being a cta I was, um it's actually five and a half months mm-hmm. um, <laughs> I got um, converted to full time, and I also got converted to being a lead CTA. So not everybody uh, gets to be a lead CTA either. Yeah. So I guess what I'm trying to portray is that you kind of have to overachieve a little bit, and you have to kind of stand out. Um, you know, you have, you kind of have to be a leader. They want to see interpersonal skills. They want to see you uh, really you know, go above and beyond and kind of help out other teammates because those are the same qualities that you're going to have to do as a CRA. So if you don't stand up from the bunch, you know, there's a lot of CTAs if you want to think of it that way and a little less CRAs, like kind of the ratio. So you kind of have to stand out in the bunch if you're trying to, uh, if that's your end goal. And then you became a CRA and lived happily ever after? 
Yes. <laughs> writing so reports. Writing reports in my evening, which I'll be doing in a little bit. Yeah. So that's kind of the life. I mean, you um, you become they kind of threw me in right away. Um, I'll, I think that some companies are trying to steer away from that now. They're trying to develop their own CRE training programs in house, and they're trying to have, um, you know, they're kind, they're trying to promote within first of all, and they're trying to pr- the people that they promote within. They're trying to uh, make sure that they're properly trained before they throw them into independent monitoring. Yep. So CRA is one of those jobs that, you know, you have to, you can't learn overnight. It's one of those jobs that you, it takes a long time to learn because a lot of it is interpersonal, like I mentioned. And a lot of it has to do with just um, knowing what to look for and what not to look for. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of, so I'm a mentor CRA now currently. So I train junior CRAs. I can sign them off on their visits. And that's called, um, we call them uh, ASVs, which are visits that, um, you know, like I would go, uh, sh- I would go monitor, uh, or someone would monitor, and then I would go shadow them basically and see, make sure that they're doing the right work. And if they're doing the right work, I would sign them off. So, um, you know, a lot of the things that I have to teach these junior CRAs is that, you know, you think that this Alcoa issue is huge, but you should actually be focusing on a bigger picture. You should actually be focusing on if the SAE that was noted is submitted within 24 hours. You should make sure that the patient was reconsented properly at the next visit. You should know. And then, you know, there's a lot more deeper knowledge. It's like, well, is it you know, for example, that ICF issue, you know, the reconsenting, do they want the subject to come back immediately to be reconsented? Some sponsors require that. Some sponsors say no, we'll be okay with reconsenting them at the next visit. Mm-hmm. So a lot of that comes from asking questions and just being alert and aware. And, um, you know, people will think that it's by reading the SOPs and all that, <laughs> but <laughs> a lot of it is hands on and a lot of it is being out there with other co-monitors and every, so that's every why- study's different that's that's the bottom yeah. line yeah exactly so that's a good transition let's give the sites we have a lot of research sites and then we'll come back and end it for the aspiring or current cras okay yeah um so research sites the what i'm most mm-hmm. interested in when a cra comes out for us mm-hmm. let's say what for a site selection visit okay mm-hmm. so of course, every study is different, but for the most part, what are you looking for? A and B. Do the sponsors actually listen to your recommendations? So, short answer uh, for A. For, short answer for B. I'll answer that one first. Okay. It's kind of no. <laughs> mm. You know, I, I hate to say it, but uh, a lot of CRAs will tell you that the decisions already made before you go on site. So and why I'm would sure they even send you? Because they, they they spend a lot of money sending these CRAs out. Like, why would they send you out knowing they're not going to choose that site? That's a good question. So I, having said that, you know, the decisions are already made. It has happened where um, a, a CRA that I know has went to a site that was already kind of pre-selected and went and realized that the site was not functional. It was just the PI. Um, he didn't really have a good grasp of what he needed to do. Um, he didn't have any backup. He didn't have a study coordinator. And, wow. and so he, you know, he said, no, I'm going to put my foot down um, and the site should not be selected at all. It's going to be a mess. And so it's kind of that, those, those kind of things. Okay. Um, Thing with site selections that I wanted to mention is important is uh, FDA 483s. I'm not sure if you're familiar with them. Yeah, warning so th- letters. Yeah. Yeah. So those are really big things that kind of factor into uh, the decision making for the sponsor. You know, they want they want to know if you're issued a 483, what your response was, and kind of the gravity of the situation of why it was issued in the first place. Okay. So that's another. And why sponsors do selection visits and not weigh them. 
And um, then the patients, the pa- having patients, you know, because every site says they have a bunch of patients at their site selection yeah. business. I mean, you might have right. some that are honest and say, hey, we're not really good at this, but we'll try. Mm-hmm. Uh, but most of the time, the sites exaggerate, right? So if everyone says they're good, I mean, how do you know which site's actually good at recruiting and which one's not? You you have to sort of play detective, right? Yeah, in a way you do. Um, I like to be more technical about it, though. So sites that say, oh, yeah, we have a ton of patients, I'll say, how many patients do you have in your database? And they'll tell me. So if it's a big hospital like an, or an academic institution, they'll tell me, oh, we have like 30,000. Okay, okay, how many? So I do oncology studies. Mm-hmm. So I'll say, okay, how many of those are, um, uh, you know, breast cancer patients? Then they'll say, oh, only about like 4,000 of those. Okay, okay how many? Those do you think have the mutation that we are looking for in the study? Let's so say, oh, one or two. So I put down one or two. <laughs> okay, so you, so it's... 30,000 to one or two. So the devil is in the details on all these things. Perfect. All right, so site selection visits. You know, am I wrong when I tell a site, the mm-hmm. study, if you have a SSV, the study mm-hmm. is basically yours to lose. Like, is that wrong? No, I think that there holds a lot of truth in that. I think that it will take a lot for a CRA not to select you. Um, me, when I go on site and I see something that, you know, doesn't follow, like, the annotations of the report that I'm doing, I usually put it as an action item. I don't completely dismiss the site because of that. I say, okay, can you send me this uh, CLIA whenever you can get it? Or okay. when are you going to get this equipment calibrated? I can put that in my report. And then send me the calibration records when you can. Yeah, right, right, okay. So, and then for an IMV for sites, mm-hmm. I mean, every protocol is different. But mm-hmm. what are what what differentiates the good sites from the bad sites, uh, in your opinion? That's a good, good question. Um, all your questions are good. <laughs> I know. Um, that's why they pay me the big bucks. Yeah, no kidding. That's why you're doing your own thing. Um so I would say the number one thing that will make me happy as a CRA is a coordinator who's entered data, a coordinator who has a good organized chart. Like I know, you know, there's no real boundaries for what you should put in a chart, your source documentation or whatnot. But if you have it in order, that means that there's going to be less transcription errors. So the most infuriating thing is, you know, having to go through a really huge binder with duplicate information or incorrect information while I'm source data verifying. So my recommendation for site owners would be pay the money to hire a good study coordinator. That's going to be your biggest investment because if you don't do that, it could also be your biggest downfall. You don't want 483 being issued because of a... Uh, error that the study coordinator who only has high school experience and didn't know better had did a mistake you know even though you have oversight you cannot as a pi or as a site owner you cannot have control over everything but if you really invest into a good study coordinator even if you don't ha- you know if you have one or two backups for them i would you know i, w- I would really recommend taking the time to train someone mm-hmm. good the backup but really having that main coordinator being very experienced and very good yeah i've heard like um for the most part the monitors you know they'll try to work with the sites and then if mm-hmm. the site's still having issues they do what's called a corrective action plan and mm-hmm. maybe the sponsor or the cro will put the site on hold but mm-hmm. have have i mean would a cro or sponsor ever contact the FDA and say, hey, we have a bad site here. Um, I don't think that really happens, does it? Unless there's fraud. Yeah, I honestly haven't heard of that happening, not to say. Um, But we usually, so from a CRA standpoint, point, that's actually our job to prevent things like that from happening. Like I actually, when I try to explain to people what my job is, which is very difficult to do, I say I do a lot of pre-audit work. I want to mention that I prevent any, I want to pre- prevent the FDA from, you know, coming in and finding something really bad. Like I'm there to help the site out. I want to make sure that everything is being followed by protocol. Finding so. a whole bunch of stuff. Now you're, as a CRA, 
you mm -hmm. have a lot of influence over whether the site gets put on a screening hold, whether they need a corrective action plan. Um, mm -hmm. Is that, like, let's say the site is put on a screening hold and are mm -hmm. forced to do a corrective action plan, is mm -hmm. that the end-all, be-all, or do you think that site usually uh, is allowed to screen again? I'm asking yeah, for I'm, I'm asking for a friend. I'm sure you are. <laughs> very very specific question. Yes. Now, I don't think it's the end of it. I have, um, you know, I have had experience with enrollment closed sites, and um, first of all, the very last thing that a CRA wants to do actually is put you on hold. So mm. keep that in mind. They will do everything in their power to actually not put you on hold. But if there's no cooperation, if there's no PI oversight and there's no, um, like, willingness to fix the situation, then that's what's going to happen eventually. Yeah. Because the sponsor doesn't, what the sponsor doesn't want to do is put themselves in a situation where they have an enrollment open site that's constantly making mistakes, mm -hmm. and um, they're just, you know, and a bunch of stuff is going to be found that's not right. You know, they want to make sure that the data does have integrity. So what they're going to do is going to close the site, send CRAs out there to clean it up. And then once it's cleaned up, they're going to see if there's new SOPs. So I so I have had experience with that, actually. I had a site where they had a 483 and they were like enrollment closed before. And I had to go do um, an SSV for them. This was for another study, you know. And what I did, what the sponsor asked me to do was to go there, make sure that their new SOPs are reflective of the action that they've taken, you know, to remedy previous situations, that they have a new system that has quality control in it. So if you show new SOPs, if you show a new system of, um, you know, hey, we're, we, we hired uh, more resources because our issue was we didn't have enough resources and everything which is being thrown into the EDC or the study visits were being missed. If you show that you've taken action to correct those steps, then it's mm -hmm. kind of like a second chance at things. Yeah, and we'll wrap up because I know you got to go write those reports, uh, yeah. Suha. But because uh, um, I got to do that Wednesday. But <laughs> I interviewed Brenda, who teaches for the CRA Academy, but she's also a okay. senior CRA. She didn't yeah. want to be on camera, but she, you know, uh, she, her voice was there. And mm. uh, she said, basically, she's had many experiences where the sponsor loved the PI. Mm -hmm. And the PI did not know how to run a study, but they were a key opinion leader. And mm -hmm. despite her recommendations, like, you know, the site's not good, the sponsor right. didn't care. So have right. you, how common is that? Or is that rare? I think it happens whenever um, it's a, it happens when the drug is like really rare, like, like biologics mm. or when they're like wanting, they're really wanting like an involved response from the doctors. Okay. Not PIs from the doctors. So they get these doctors, they talk to them, they're saying, Hey, we're going to have this drug. What's your opinion on it? And then the, the doctors are involved. And then these doctors later, you know, they happen to own research sites. So mm -hmm. naturally they're being selected to do this thing. And so they already have a close relationship with sponsors. So not to say that there's any bias or anything. It's just an easier way for, like, the sponsor already has that relationship with these yeah. doctors. So That's a good way not? to explain it. Yeah. Yeah, thank so you like, for explaining I that. That makes sense, actually. Because these doctors are, like celebrities in their little world and exactly. other doctors are going to look at them and say hey i did this clinical trial and i'm yeah. recommending this drug so mm -hmm. it makes a lot of sense thank you for clearing that up finally uh mm -hmm. things cras can do so we helped the aspiring cras okay just you mm -hmm. gotta go out and get it it's not gonna come to yeah. you start yeah. early do it now get a broker or whatever it's called a recruiter <laughs> recruiter um yeah. and then just uh, get entry level regulatory whatever then we help the sites out with the site selection visits uh, what makes mm -hmm. a good site and a bad site all right what about existing cras uh, this last two minutes will be dedicated to them um sure. like myself i'm an existing cra so yeah how do you not lose your job how do you not screw up um i think what cro are shifting towards now is they want 
this is cold hard truth right they want uh yes people like they want yes men so mm. you know don't don't say oh like i don't want to do this you know if they're sending you somewhere if they're signing you on a study my recommendation as a cra would be to you know go along with that naturally mm. um another thing for existing cras is you have to understand you know this is kind of like more for cra's that you know are like cra1 or cra2s you have to understand that it's very demanding work-life balance. So you have to have like a long-term goal or kind of know what other areas you want to go into eventually. Mm-hmm. So you got to start thinking about that pretty early. Site you know? owners, hit me up, CRAs. <laughs> There's a lot of you out there. You're not alone. Yeah, yeah. So you could go into that. You can become clinical lead. You can become project managers. They're all still very demanding, um, you know, 40, 50, 60 hours a week jobs, but right. nothing's easy in life. So. Very good. <laughs> Thank you. Is it true? We'll end with this one. Is it myth, <laughs> myth or reality? All right, what's the opposite of myth? I guess uh, reality. Um, once you're a CRA, let's say for two mm-hmm. years, okay, because this is something I keep hearing. I don't know if it's true or not. You're a uh-huh. CRA. You have two years of experience. You will never get fired. You can just quit and do something else. Like another, you could work for another CRO, right? Like you, you're rarely going to get fired. Is that false? True or false? Um, I would say it's more on the false side. There's, there is job security, but it's not that strong. Um, CROs can get blacklisted if they really mess up. Yeah. They get, oh yeah. Like if you, you know, if you don't know how to do your job, it will show eventually. Um, one way or another, there's a lot of safety nets in the CRA job, thankfully, cause I'm, I value that integrity a lot. So as a CRA myself, I want other CRAs to perform really well. So it's, you know, it's for a good reason. Cause this has to do with patient safety and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but maybe what I've heard is there's high turnover, which is true. If you do have a couple years experience, you can start looking at other places to hire you yeah. if you're not happy with your company that let's say like, you you know you screwed up the writings on the wall and before they fire you, you go work somewhere else i wouldn't recommend that ethically ah ethically <laughs> yes would, yeah i would definitely say definitely own up to your mistakes let your manager know keep them in the loop right if you have a good manager or you know if you have good um morals then you know it's gonna be like hey i'm gonna say that i screwed up Mm-hmm. And it's it's really hard to screw up that big. I mean, I can't think of any scenario where it's like detrimental. Like unless you're not doing your job. I mean, that's the only the only exactly case. If you're not doing your job consistently. Then I would say reflect on if it's a matter of the co- you don't like the company that you're working for, or if you don't like being a CRA. You know, otherwise yeah. you're gonna do. Because most CRAs I've met are super good, like come across my sites and they're super good. But we've had some that are like below average and well, I mean, we don't complain about them. It's less work for us, but I know they're not doing their job and they, they still manage to keep their job and they, they go yeah. work somewhere else. So I guess uh, there is some job security there. Exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you, uh, Suha. If anyone wants to reach you, where do they go? How do they find you? They can add me on LinkedIn. S-U-H-A-S-A-L-A-H. All right. Thank you. I will have your uh, link down there. And uh, enjoy your monitoring reports. (laughs) Thank Uh, you. And uh, we'll talk soon, all right? Thank you, everyone, for watching and listening. And uh, take care.